already, uh, this already eighth session of the Green Post Corona Talks, organized by the Green European Foundation. And this session is in partnership with the Finnish Foundation Vision and also the Flemish think tank, Oikos. I'm Dirk Holmans, co-president of the Green European Foundation and your host. And as we learned during previous sessions, people from all over Europe are following this, which is quite uh, amazing. And if you're following by Facebook Live, you can put your uh, questions uh, there. You can also use Twitter to put questions. I see them in my chat box. And so I can ask your questions to the three inspiring speakers we have today to discuss the future or the importance of the universal basic income UB. Um, because as we all know now with the COVID-19 crisis, quite some people have lost their jobs. Uh, more people, unfortunately, will lose their jobs. So it's crucial that we find new solutions so that the income of people is not dependent or only dependent on having a job. In order to discuss uh, a wide range of issues connected with UB, we have three inspiring speakers today. First, we have Julian Bolin. He's a UB researcher, economist, and member of the Basque Parliament. Next, we have Natalie Bennett. She's an UB advocate, former leader of the Green Party in English and Wales, and now member of the UK House of Lords. Third, we have Alvina Alametsa. She's member of the European Parliament for the Greens AFI Group. We will start with Julian to give us some insights on the more general discussion around UB in Spain. And also, I, and then I think this is very important on what the media reported as the UB in Spain, because in reality, I think it's better to speak about the minimum living income. And so Julian, I'm very happy to give you the floor as first speaker. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dirk. And um, thank you also to the Green European Foundation and everybody who's, who's having a look at uh, this, this chat we're having right now. Uh, first of all, well, I just wanted to say that I'm not right now a member of the Basque Parliament since uh, February, but uh, well, it uh, doesn't matter for, for what I'm going to say right now. Well, as, as you said, Dirk, uh, what the Spanish government um, has carried out uh, is not a basic income, but a minimum state coverage income, which is called IMV in Spanish, uh, Ingreso Minimo Vital. So, why the government uh, has done this? Because until now, uh, Spain didn't have a minimum national income as the rest of, of European countries, since the competence of social assistance resides in autonomous communities and not in the state, uh, like for example, Catalonia, Madrid, uh, Basque Country, Andalusia, and so on. But still, uh, it's been shown that even the best minimum income in Spain, which is the Basque one, uh, and is among uh, the best at the European level, it's not enough to end poverty. And this is something we already know perfectly because lots of studies have shown uh, that there are structural uh, errors that every minimum income program contains. So the question is, once we know that minimum income programs do not end um, with poverty, how can we do it? And well, I think uh, many of us agree that an unconditional basic income is a great tool for it, but not only because it, it ends uh, with poverty, but also because it has many other benefits uh, that we understand uh, that are priorities for our society. For example, uh, giving citizens real and, and effective freedom, uh, putting people in the center of public policies, uh, moving towards a more sustainable economy with our planet, or uh, offering uh, the dignity that was stolen from from a large part of our society. And I've seen, and as you said also, Dirk, uh, I'm sure lots of you also did, uh, how the international press and also the Spanish press uh, has said many, many times that Spain was going to be the first country implementing a basic income. Uh, that's not true, but uh, I would like to ask uh, why we think uh, this happened. Why did most English media and some Spanish media confuse a minimum income with a basic income? And uh, from my point of view, uh, I would say there are at least four main reasons for, for this. First, 
because of lack of knowledge and absolute disinterest on, on this task. Unfortunately, right now, I think newspaper or television doesn't care about calling basic income what is not a basic income. They wouldn't even care about calling pineapple a uh, banana. So they just want to sell more and more and to have big shares on the TV. Second, in Spain, many, many minimum incomes have been called and still continue to be called basic income in the law itself. Therefore, uh, there are many people who confuse those terms. And that's normal. Because you go to your administration and you ask for what in the law is called basic income. So for you, a basic income is basically a minimum income. Third, uh, members of the Spanish government and members of different autonomous governments in Spain are the ones who also do it. How are we going to make citizens differentiate between uh, those terms if the economy minister herself on a prime, uh, on a prime time TV program when speaking about a minimum income, calls it a basic income. So that's nonsense, but a lot of politicians do. And finally, because since Finland launched uh, its pilot project, everything that sounds like basic income is really, really sexy for us. Everything but, uh, except the content, since no party dares uh, to take it on its electoral program. So um, all in all, uh, well, I just wanted to, to make it clear that uh, what well, last Friday, was just approved in Spain has been a minimum income as uh, other European countries have uh, and not a basic income. And I could be a lot of time speaking about this minimum income uh, because we've been studying it really, really carefully. But I just wanted to make and uh, to point out uh, three points that uh, could give us some information about how it will work. First, the amount of the minimum income for one person will be equal to the 62% of the poverty line in Spain, up to the 44% of the Spanish minimum wage. So I think uh, this is a uh, low quantity to be able to, to live with dignity in, in this country. Second, it's intended to cover 2.3 million people in poverty at most. In Spain, before the COVID-19 crisis, there were 10 million people at risk of poverty. So right now, this minimum income will at most cover 20% of people at risk of poverty in Spain. And third, this minimum income uh, will begin to be received at the earliest, uh, at the end of June. And there are many people, a lot of families who have been uh, without any income since February. So if the administration uh, doesn't collapse in its management, uh, which I think it's also very likely, there will be many people who will be without any income for at least four months. So I think there were a lot of opportunities to face, to face this crisis. And uh, even though a lot of measures uh, that this government has carried out uh, have been really important and really social, uh, I would like to see a braver government in, in this sense. To put an example, I think we had the opportunity to establish uh, an emergency basic income during, during this year uh, to face the pandemic and with which uh, all people will have a monthly income guarantee. And we know that there is no time for a fiscal reform and to institutionalize a basic income in just two weeks, but that's not a problem because this emergency basic income could be adjusted uh, through next year tax declaration, income tax declaration. So there were different opportunities we have been talking about during this month. And I think uh, a minimum income is not the best at all. It's something we have seen. Uh, it doesn't work properly. And uh, it's something we know will leave a lot of people behind. And I think it's also very important uh, to finish uh, to talk about the benefits of uh, universality, individuality, and unconditionality. Because these three principles, I think, are essential to eradicate poverty. And this minimum income is not universal, nor individual, nor unconditional. It's given to families who have shown to the administration, ex ante, that they need that, this income and with a process of labor inclusion to take. So we know that this could deepen into problems we already know, such as a stigmatization of the beneficiaries, the poverty trap, administration costs, 
uh, budgetary limitations or the huge coverage errors that we know minimum income, income programs have. And we have already seen uh, this minimum income in Spain will also have, as it will only cover 2.3 million out of 10 million at risk of poverty right now in Spain. Okay, uh, Julian, many, many thanks for this uh, really clarification because indeed when I was reading newspaper, I was say, oh, wow, we are introducing uh, in Spain a universal unconditional basic income. But as you explained, we are talking about uh, kind of minimum living income for a number of people, only 20% of the people living in poverty on conditions for families, so not individuals. So it's a total different story. Totally. Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, first clarification. Now I will want to give the floor to Natalie Bennett. She's, as I said, member of the UK House of Lords, and she has been advocating UB for many, many years. She's also involved in the projects of the Green European Foundation. And yeah, Natalie, I'm wondering, uh, the UK is really hit very hard by the COVID-19 crisis. Is the UB part of the political or societal discussion in your country as a potential measure? Well, I think it's worth sort of going back to before COVID-19, if we can go back that far. And actually, we were already seeing universal basic income was really rising up the political agenda. We've seen particularly the, the rise of what's known as the UBI Labs Network which is actually a global network of local groups organising to advocate for UBI, but that's particularly strong. And I think it's, it could be said it's been led from the UK. So that was the context of a great deal of popular support and growing discussion. Um, there is no political party except for the Green Party that advocates for it in the UK. Um, and there's a lot of resistance in the Labour Party to it, but that was the political context. Then, of course, COVID-19 arrived, and that was another big jump in the level of debate and discussion, because what we've seen in the UK is, you know, I think there was a lot of surprise that the government did throw a huge amount of money to people with salary furlough schemes, with schemes for the, the um, self-employed uh, and people with their own small businesses, etc. But what became very obvious was that how people were falling through the gaps in those schemes. So for example, if you had a small business and wanted to get support, uh, you had to have three years of accounts. Um, and people who were just in between jobs when the lockdown started, it's known as the new starter furlough people, they got left with no money through absolutely no fault of their own. So those kind of things have really helped to raise the whole question of consistency. I would say we're just starting to begin to debate it. It's still very early days, but that's very much happening. And in the UK, you, we are a society in many ways crying out more than most even for a universal basic income. Um, 16 million people in the UK have less than 100 pounds of savings. Uh, people have gig economy type jobs, zero hours contracts, low minimum wages, no chance to save. And so this, it's a deeply insecure society. And we've been starting to see with the medical impact of COVID-19, acknowledgement of what a risk that is in terms of if you're asking people to um, self-isolate because they've been exposed or because they've got symptoms, and we have statutory sick pay of essentially 100 pounds a week. Um, so, you know, it's very difficult for people to do that, yet that's what they should do for the public health of all of us. Um, what we've seen also um, a lot of debate among the universal basic income advocates about whether or not to do this, but we have actually seen put forward two separate quite similar proposals for an emergency universal basic income, because there's an acknowledgement that uh, as we start to come out of the um, lockdown period, as schemes like the furlough salary furlough scheme and the um, help for self-employed end, more people are going to fall through the cracks through absolutely no fault of their own. And so we've got these two proposals, and I think the links to um, information about both of those are going up in the, in the Facebook chat. Um, 
one from the Citizens Income Trust, um, long-term advocate of UBI, and another from the UBI Labs Network themselves. And both of those are actually come at about similar levels um, and suggest maybe two months of around about £1,000 um, each month going to, uh, to every individual to be recovered if their income is decent from the tax system later. Now, there was a lot of debate about whether an emergency basic income was a good idea or not, you know, just doing something temporarily and short. There will inevitably be some problems with it. Will people just see this as an emergency thing where they want to actually say this is something that should be there the whole time? Uh, but I think there's an opportunity to really broaden the discussion, get people talking about that, get people thinking about this. And there's also a very large practical point because one of the problems in the United Kingdom is that the government really has no record of citizens, doesn't know where citizens are. We don't have ID cards. Um, there's you know, one, a million, more than a million people who don't have a bank account. So one of the practical problems, and when we were when COVID nineteen really first struck, there was talk about advocating an immediate universal basic income. But the problem is the practical reality of how you actually get it to people is not simple or easy to solve. And really, you've got to acknowledge that you have to um, to just do the best you can and iron out the problems as and when they arise. So I think now we have a huge moment of opportunity for UBI in the UK. In many ways, we're, we're you know, a perfect society to introduce it because we are a society in a very bad place. I mean, we've seen um, just overnight um, some reports coming out talking about how there's been huge efforts going into trying to help children from disadvantaged backgrounds to do better at school. We have a very large gap in, in the attainment levels of pupils from very disadvantaged backgrounds compared to those from wealthier backgrounds. Um, and measures suggest essentially any of the progress that's been made in that has been wiped out. Uh, and so you know, there's a, the question of saying, you know, we just cannot allow these levels of inequality to continue these levels of poverty, these levels of desperate insecurity, combined with the the medical impact of, you know, we have to allow people to keep themselves at home if they need to do that. So, so it's a time of real possibility, but, you know, British politics is, um, I think, uh, as anyone will, who perhaps saw yesterday, the 1.2 kilometre long queue of MPs um, socially distancing voting, uh, which took about uh, 40 to 50 minutes each time. Yeah, we have a real problem with British politics being in a state of considerable chaos and confusion. Um, and that's seen with our management of COVID-19 as many other things. Um, so you know, we're not going to see the government abandoning conditionality. They're trying to screw down even harder on conditionality. I was in a debate in the House yesterday. We have um, the BBC is funded through a licence fee. And that has been free to over 75s. And that's now about to disappear, except for people who are on pension credit. But again, there's millions or 1.2 million pensioners who don't claim the pension credit they're entitled to. The problem of conditionality again appearing that if you have something people have to apply for, for all people won't get it. So the arguments for a payment that ensures nobody is left without a penny in their pocket. You know, they're really very strong, but the political situation at the moment is probably best described as very confused and very chaotic. But what we're also seeing is a really encouraging sign is that there's a real push towards local democracy. Um, we've had some trial citizens assembly, we've had a climate citizens assembly. Um, and so there is quite an upswell of public engagement in politics, determination to, to take control in politics. And that with the UBI Labs network um, is part of a direction of travel that, that, that is hopeful, very hopeful. And what we can all do as campaigners is make sure that we get the discussion out there. We, we get real engagement, not just with the idea of the universal basic income, but an understanding of what's wrong with conditionality and how conditionality of benefits um, you, people miss out, people fall through the cliffs, people hit cliff edges, as when you hit with a benefits trap, 
when you earn just a little bit too money, much money and you lose a great deal, all those things that UBI takes away, um, it, there is real opportunities to spread that story in the UK at the moment. Um, and one of the other things also, I think, is the gender aspect of UBI, um, which is worth highlighting and that COVID-19 has helped to highlight. Um, there's stats here, and indeed, certainly I've seen in other countries also, that um, the burden, particularly of childcare, um, in when the schools have been closed, has fallen overwhelmingly on women. And so there is a renewed focus on, on how so many people contribute to our society in ways that are not waged labour, um, but that are not recognised, and the demands that they make those contributions it does real damage to their financial and personal well-being and the ways in which UBI helps to address that is something that again we've got a real political opportunity to address. So I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there um, and I look forward to the questions and discussion. Okay Natalie. Thank you very much for uh, informing us uh, situation in the UK and also telling me I was still muted. Uh, now we turn to the third speaker, Alvina Alametsa. Uh, Alvina, you're a member of the European Parliament, so it means we are quite interested in your views from the EU level on the discussion on the UB and also what are the possibilities for, let's say, uh, EU-wide UB trials. But also, of course, we are very much interested on what came out of the UB trails in Finland. I heard there are new additional findings published. So maybe first you could inform us on the new findings on the UB trails in your country. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, first, the classical question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So uh, thank you, thank you all for very interesting introductions before me. And uh, so I am a member of parliament, but also a Finnish politician. And uh, thus I have very closely followed the discussion of the universal basic income here in my home country, but also in, in Brussels. Um, basically, what I found interesting is that uh, there was this universal basic income trial here in Finland in 2017 to 2018. And this trial was implemented during uh, the last governmental period. And uh, the government uh, itself uh, was uh, more of a right-wing government. And uh, they did not have basic support for UBI, but it was part of a trial to see how we could reform our social security system. Because in Finland, the current system also is that everybody is, is basically guaranteed universal income it's not a basic income in that sense that uh, when um, when uh, you you apply for the income you get it but it's not automatical and universal in that way as Natalie kind of explained what's the idea of universal basic income and um, the last government then made this trial uh, only to those people who are already unemployed most of them were unemployed for a long term it was a small sample size of 2,000 people, and the age groups were 25 to 50 year, 58 year old people. So, what we see here from the green perspective is, of course, that the uh, the trial had many problems. Uh, the in the beginning, it was too small. Uh, it was not uh, comprehensive to all the different age groups because you can see that, for example, for young people the universal basic income might have even more benefits than uh, to older people, etc. So we found that there was problems with the trial, but nevertheless, uh, the, the trial actually was very positive. And uh, it was sometimes um, uh, reported in the news that it didn't uh, make much difference in employment, for example. And this is true. Uh, there was only a small correlation uh, that uh, uh, there would be less unemployment with the universal basic income. So, but there was not such a vast increase of uh, employment. But then um, 
uh, the more interesting finding is that people with basic income felt mentally and physically a lot better and healthier than the people with other benefits. And here we have the interesting gist that this actually provides um, many other economic opportunities and it actually is beneficial economically for the government also from these ways also, not only unemployment or decreasing unemployment, but also uh, by um, increasing the well-being, you can of course cut different costs in, in the, the social sector. So in the Finnish experiment, what we found in the research was that people experienced less stress, depression and loneliness. They felt more secure about their own economic situation and they felt more trust towards other people, public institutions and society. Also, they were a lot more optimistic about their own future. And here we can see that we would need this kind of a trial also for those young people in Finland and different groups of people, because uh, we see that these kind of influences are huge for their future also, and how people can build their own life. I very much agree with the point that Natalie made that it's also a gender question, it's a feminist question in many ways. And I don't talk only about women here, but people who are in different minorities or people who have mental health issues or people who do voluntary work and uh, be, are caregivers in their family, for example. All these kind of situations are a lot easier when you get the universal basic income. So I think it's a good equalizer in that sense. And also what it uh, what it does is that it makes it possible for people to build a society in different ways that they enjoy and also to educate themselves. It's, this has to have positive income uh, compared to the other forms of social security. And the last point I wanted to raise is that uh, Really, the, one of the most important things in universal basic income is mental health. We have very strong evidence of the mental health impacts, positive mental health impacts, what, what I also referred to before. And in Finland, the mental health problems annually cost the society 11 billion euros a year. This is rather similar to other societies and in European level, uh, in European Union level, the, the cost for GDP is 4% annually for untreated mental health problems. So, uh, if the universal basic income is one way to decrease the mental health issues, that also brings a big economical argument for the universal basic income. And uh, these findings are true all across Europe. Uh, also, there was an interesting research from the European Agency for Safety and Health, Health at Work, and they stated that up to half of the work days that are lost are lost due to stress and mental issues. So, in many, many ways, we could uh, make the society better and uh, increase the well being with this kind of social security reform. This is what I find interesting. It's not only about unemployment per se, but it's also about mental health, well-being and other values that we have in the society. And at the same time, it brings a lot of economical benefits for the states and society. Okay, thank you for this uh, explanation on the Finnish trial. Maybe you could also maybe uh, inform us What's the discussion on the EU level? Do you see a possibility for an EU-wide QB trial? Um, what's there at stake at the moment? Definitely, definitely I see a possibility and I hope there is a possibility for this. And that is also something that I have been trying to now push as a new MAP. There was a poll actually that was conducted a research in March this year and um, According to this one, 71% of Europeans support the introduction of universal basic income. So 71% of Europeans, that's a huge number. And uh, one explanative point to this is the Corona crisis, which also was referred to from the previous speakers. The coronavirus crisis has shown the vulnerability of our social security systems and people. So 
I believe that this crisis has had an impact on the fact that people are now a lot more supportive of the universal basic income. And uh, yeah, many social safety nets and mechanisms that we have now have not been helpful enough for people in their economic hardship at the moment. So uh, especially I think that universal basic income in the European level would be beneficial for the underemployed, self-employed, entrepreneurs, students, people who don't have as much economic security and stability. And um, as I said, also the mental health, it's not a Finnish problem, but it's a European wide problem. And this can be one research based solution to self solve uh, this problem. In the European Greens, uh, there is already, I believe, uh, a large amount of people who are ready for a more comprehensive and even EU wide universal basic income trials. But there is no um, there, there is no certain idea in the Greens, for example, that there should be this model for social security or this UBI, but I believe that it's more about openness to search for new potential and more possibilities. And I believe that the research and trial in different EU states funded by EU would be very interesting in terms of basic rights, basic human rights for income and mental, mental health and well-being. So here we need uh, these kind of trials as all across Europe, the societies have changed, the uh, working life has changed and employment has become more precarious, but the society has not changed after this in, in uh, terms of the social safety networks. So those systems have to be reformed to match the current challenges, I think. And actually, uh, in EU, there is also a European wide citizens initiative that is going to be launched at the 25th of September this year. So there is the goal to gather uh, 1 million signatures for this uh, universal basic income uh, EU wide uh, implementation and I hope that this initiative will get people to talk more about UBI and have discussions on this and I very much support this initiative. And a good way to start is of course the EU wide trials and, and research. So uh, yes, I believe that there is possibility and as Natalie also said, I believe there is momentum in different countries because of the current coronavirus situation and people have understood that we need reforms. Okay, thank you very much. Meanwhile, the first questions are popping up in my chat box. So we have a first question, a question for clarification for Julian. Julian, the risk of poverty for less than 60% of the medium income. Uh, could you yeah, explain this a little yeah. bit? Yeah, that it, it's the, the risk of poverty in, in, in statistical numbers, uh, what the European Union takes as a risk of poverty. So in Spain, that would be around um, 739 euros per month, more or less. So your income has to be less if you want to apply for this uh, minimum income scheme. No, no, no. I, I was saying that risk of poverty in Spain, uh, right now there are like 10 million people in the risk of poverty. Uh, this income will give uh, Will will be given or will be will have a coverage of uh, approximately 2.3 million people. So it's like a 20 percent of people at risk of poverty. This income will be equal to uh, 462 euros for one person. So 462. You have, yeah, that's it. So you have to have uh, less than uh, 452. 10 euros less than the amount in order to be able to access. If you are less than that, it says on the law that you are vulnerable. So you can access to this minimum income. So as you see, it has nothing to do with, with basic income. Okay, thank you very much for this clarification. We have a second question for uh, Alvina. Somebody's writing, Scottish Greens were considering proposing an amendment to the EGP Corona Recovery Plan supporting a European Euro universal basic income rather than minimum in citizens' income 
based in different national weights. Would there be support from other green parties in Europe to include basic income in the Corona recovery plan? Thank you for the good question. Well, personally, I do hope, of course, that there would be willingness from other parties to include it also. And uh, I believe that in the member states, um, many, as we mentioned, many states and many countries are already willing to implement and try this. And um, I believe that there is um, differences, of course, related to how the societies currently are and how they function and what kind of problems the politicians see in universal basic income, what kind of threats and possibilities. Uh, for us in Finland, maybe the reason that, that our experiment and uh, the basic income has some potential is that we have already had the social security system uh, in which uh, everybody gets this uh, public public social security if they need it. But then the universal basic income would be then uh, the modern reform because it would um, it would uh, decrease the bureaucracy a lot that is related now to the social security system because everybody would easily get the social security. And also something we know from research previously from Finland also is that people miss out of the income that they would be entitled to because when they have to apply it, then it's uh, not accessible to many people anymore and not accessible maybe in some uh, difficult life situations. So that is actually a major problem we have identified in Finland as well, that there is actually uh, underuse of the social security benefits and the basic income would be one solution to this. So what I think is that, that uh, we need more countries and decision makers, politicians to discuss these possibilities and to identify what are the challenges that there are currently in, in your country and uh, how could social security reforms solve them. In some places, I understand that the relevant next step would be, for example, a minimum income. Um, in Finland, we already have kind of such a system uh, because we have uh, all, it's a social security system, but also we have a, we have a legislation on how much uh, the companies have to pay for people and such. But I believe that in many countries, the starting points are different. So, of course, the implementation then is uh, related to that. But to see what kind of challenges are there out there and see if the universal basic income would address some of them is very beneficial. And in Finland, that is the case that we see that most of the challenges, the universal basic income would actually uh, answer really well to them. Okay, thanks. Uh, Natalie, you've been active in the transnational project and you may to be I from the Green European Foundation. Maybe you can, uh, yeah also inform us about uh, what came out of this project, what are proposals or results which can also be related to the current discussion. Yes, certainly. Um, just to pick up um, on what Alvina was saying, just sort of as a point of information that people may be interested in, Scotland um, has very much been the leading part of the UK in, um, in this area and a group called the Royal Society of Arts, a very long established um, NGO, um, has been doing a lot of work on setting up trials in Scotland. And in fact, the First Minister of Scotland, um, Nicola Sturgeon, has actually told the Prime Minister that um, she wants to see a, a universal basic income in Scotland. So it's, it's the most advanced area there. And the project, I mean, I would point people and perhaps someone can put a link in the Facebook. We produced a, a series of reports um, or, or a report uh, that contains a wide range of European perspectives. And one of the things I was just reflecting as Alvina was say, was talking was um, uh, we took part in a study tour to Finland. And that was um, uh, the, the amount of effort required, the cost of the bureaucracy you know, we were very struck because we, as visitors to Finland, you know, think of Finland, no Finland has possibly you know, the best or one of the best welfare systems in Europe. Uh, but talking to people, social workers who worked with um, people with drug and alcohol and mental health issues, um, they were saying they still spent about 70% of their time trying to make sure their clients got the money they were entitled to. And we were talking about how much 
resources that would potentially free up for them to actually do their work of helping people tackle their problems rather than just helping them survive and get enough money to eat. Um, so you know, I think what we found in that, in that study looking across Europe, I'd very much echo what Alvina said, that people start from very different places. There are very different um, societies. Um, I mean, I would just say that I'm, I'm confident the Green Party of England and Wales, coming back to the, the question as basic question, will certainly back that as in the, in the recovery plan. Um, I think, you know, the idea of running trials, um, one of the things that came out of it ever the our studies was there's trials that are run um, so that a government can say they've done something and there are trials that are done with the intention of actually working out how you set something up and make it work. And one of the things we need to very much make sure we're promoting trials, but promoting trials as being a way towards actual full implementation um, rather than something that lets people say, oh, we've done that. That's it. Okay. Then, of course, uh, not uh, an original question, but still, uh, I think, fundamental one is how could uh, you be defended either on the national level or the European level? So who wants to respond to that? Maybe Julian, you can start. How, how could it be funded? Yeah, how to finance a UB. All right, all right. Well, um, sometimes people say financing of uh, basic income is a problem, but I really don't think it's, it's a problem uh, because we know that there is uh, enough wealth and uh, the only question is how we distribute that wealth. So uh, basic income would only be a rate distribution of wealth. For example, during this pandemic uh, in Spain, we have spent more than 200,000 euros. An, an annual basic income would have a net cost which is less than 20% of those resources. So I think financing it's just a political will uh, and it has just to be made a fiscal reform and um, there's no problem about that because we know there, there, is, there is enough money for that. And uh, for example, the, the we were speaking also about a European level minimum income and so on. Uh, our vice president also did with uh, some pro uh, minister of Italy and of you know, Portugal a uh, proposal of a European minimum income. Uh, and I think uh, that could be a step forward, but uh, I don't think that could take us never to a basic income because I think conditionality will never take us to unconditionality. So I think a better proposal for that could be starting from a low quantity, let's say a euro dividend uh, for all European citizens. And that, I think, uh, it could help to fight against also euro skepticism while uh, strengthening our sense of belonging to the European Union. And this could be financed in many ways, for example, uh, by a European VAT, a European corporative tax, a European carbon tax, or financial transaction tax. There are many ways. And its benefits, I think, would be great for all. This euro dividend will provide a, a fair dis redistributive mechanism, and it could make sure that uh, all Europeans equally benefit from the wealth generated by the European integration. And I would like to point out just some benefits of that. First of all, it will improve the condition of the worst of European citizens uh, who would access, of course, a complementary European and conditional basic income. Second, it would provide uh, a mechanism of solidarity in the form of transnational uh, fiscal transfer, which are, I think, necessary for the Eurozone at this moment where there are big differences between member states. And third, uh, I think this could help also to a significant reduction of the push factors for migration within the EU, uh, avoiding the um, so negative uh, the negative effect of uh, losing human capital in some countries, as it's uh, happening right now. And finally, last but not least, uh, I think this would, as I said, certainly have a beneficial effect on the European Union's legitimacy and popular support right now. So I think next step could be a European level uh, basic income. It's a low amount of basic income that it could be uh, top up 
uh, by member states and later on by the European Union. Okay, thanks. Uh, Alvina or Natalie, you want to also comment on this uh, proposal for European dividends? Uh, yes, I, I, I will. Um, I, I'm going to um, leave the European question since sadly I'm um, talking to you from Europe, but not from within the European Union, tragically. If we look at the broader philosophical point, um, the Green Party of England and Wales has had two, uh, fought two elections with two different sets of proposals of how to fund it. The first one in 2015 was very much focused on wealth taxes and you know, taxing the rich in a way that we totally don't in the UK um, and, and multinational companies. Um, now, I think if we think about that, um, there's a, a way of looking at universal basic income as a way of distributing the, the social capital, the capital that history created, that all, the, that all of our ancestors you know, built structures, created wealth in society, uh, sometimes through colonialism, stole wealth, but nonetheless, the wealth is here now. And so you know, what we're doing is sharing out the resource that's available to everybody. Um, and if we think about, you know, one of my favorite lines on this is that um, if you put Bill Gates on a desert island, he wouldn't make a penny. Rich people, rich individuals and companies benefit from all the infrastructure that society's created. And what you're doing is, is sharing that out through the payment of universal basic income. What we did in 2019 was we changed the focus somewhat. And this was in some ways a result of the, the Gilets Jeunes, the um, yellow jacket protesters in France. And, you know, we saw with them a great deal of anger that relatively poor people felt they were being made with carbon taxes to pay while France was actually cutting taxes on the wealthy. Um, and so we looked at saying, here's a carbon tax and the money for the carbon tax goes to everybody through UBI. And that creates a very clear link between what we have to do on the environment with social justice. And so I think that's a, you know, another useful way of looking at it. But ultimately, of course, you know, the final thing to say is that COVID-19, as we saw with the financial crash, when they want to bail out the banks, when they want to bail out the economy, um, very large sums of money are found very quickly. They can be found, it can be done. Okay, thanks. Um, Alvina, you want to comment on this point? Yes, I, I think those are very relevant uh, arguments made. And uh, from the European Union perspective, I do feel that this would be a good thing to use um, European resources for, uh, both in the level of the nation states, but also I believe there should be discussion on how can we use the corona survival packages in this way that we can support people's basic income also. And in general, many people are quite strict about the competencies of you and say that this is not uh, something that you should cover. And of course, I'm, I'm also uh, very much in favor of subsidiarity principle and deciding about many things where they are close to the people. But then I think that uh, well-being and mental health and income are also human rights questions, especially during a crisis time. And they have been left to a little bit of uh, small attention in the EU. So I, I really hope that we could also also fund projects like this. And generally, I hope that there would be more fairness and justice in, in funding corona crisis aftermath. Right now, many people have lost their jobs and lost their income and don't get that much social security. And at the same time, there is a problem of uh, unequal taxation, for example, in the European Union level. So many of the major corporations, businesses and owners uh, are paying very little taxes. So I think that we must look into these questions of, uh, of fairness and justice in the tax systems and in what kind of project we fund. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm, uh, we move on to the next question and I'm delighted that we have a question from someone from Egypt, but it is not an easy question. So the question is, 
It is great to hear discussion about possible solutions to the economic impact COVID-19 will have in European countries. But as we know, countries outside of Europe and with less resources will also be hit very hard by this crisis. And this can potentially cause instability. How do we make sure there is attention paid as well? Would you have any suggestions on how? So, yeah. It, to rephrase the question, is the UB something for, let's say, uh, relatively richer countries uh, in Europe? And how can this be implemented in countries uh, in Africa? So, not the easiest question, but maybe some thoughts on it. Natalie, yeah, Natalie, please, and then Yulin. Um, thank you very much for the question, and it's great that you're on this call. I mean, I think UBI, I'm usually talking about it in a, in a um, global north context, fairly, you know, wealthy countries, because that's where I operate, that's where I am a politician. But I think UBI is potentially enormously exciting um, in the global south because what you can potentially do is relatively lower levels of money um, can make a huge difference to people's lives. And so we have seen trials done in India, trials done in Africa, where you even, and Egypt I'm sure would need more money than this, but even giving people a dollar or two a day um, can really make a difference to people's lives and people are able to save some of that and pull it and make differences to their communities. So I think you know, there is a huge argument for saying that the global north countries that have built a lot of their wealth on exploitation, on colonialism, uh, and continue you know, through multinational companies to who um, have very um, corrupt relationship with uh, foreign governments, with global south governments, um, you know, there is a real argument for saying there should be. You know, a scheme to fund, you know, ultimately a global UBI. Um, in terms of, in the context of COVID, um, I've been repeating the phrase often, you know, no one is safe until everyone is safe. You know, while ever the virus is on the loose, um, we have to be worried about everybody and the safety of everybody. And we also have to, of course, be worried about the economic security of everybody. And in fact, I was on a call this morning about the situation with Hong Kong and was listening to um, Lord Chris Patton, the, the last governor of Hong Kong. And he is a right wing politician, not perhaps a very, very typical right wing politician, but nonetheless a right wing politician. And he was very much stressing the urgency in the context of COVID and many other human rights threats as well, that you know, we have to talk about working together, focusing on international cooperation the world might not look very um, fertile or optimistic for that at the moment, but we essentially have to keep trying to look at a cooperative international pro approach to the problems that are critical for all of us. Okay, thanks. Julian, uh, you also want to yeah. ask this question? Yeah. I, I wanted to say, well, Natalie said some, some, some things about it, uh, about, uh, well, how other countries are also, uh, um, doing pilots and so on on, on basic income, and I think uh, a universal basic income could give or could have even better benefits uh, in countries uh, that are not as rich as uh, as the European countries. For example, uh, in Mexico, uh, there's a big debate on on basic income right now. Why they are seeing that uh, a lot of people are moving to the US. And uh, in consequence, they're losing human capital for, for the country. A lot of young people moving to the US and, uh, well, not uh, doing uh, research, uh, not having enough uh, doctors and so on for, for Mexico, no? because they're living to the US uh, in order to seek uh, opportunities. So why are they living? Why is this happening? Because people, uh, normally don't leave their, their home for just for pleasure. And they're living because those people don't have their material existence and enough opportunities in their countries in Mexico. 
So they live into the US. So a basic income could be a tool for giving those people and guaranteeing those people the material existence, giving those people opportunities to reside, to rest in their country and not live into a third country. That's why I think that there is a big opportunity in, let's say, not as rich countries as European countries, like uh, some uh, North African countries, like some uh, Central American countries and so on, in order to retain their human capital and to prosper as a, as a nation. Okay, thanks. Uh, Can I also briefly comment on yeah, this? Please, please. Yes, it's a really interesting question and comments. And I, I just want to point out that right now, as we have, a, there is a major human rights crisis going on in the United States uh, with, uh, with, you know, Black Lives Matter movement that is very important right now to uh, support those victims of police brutality. And there is a lot of uh, riots and uh, also a bigger coronavirus crisis than in many places around the world. So I just want to point out as an example that uh, basically, uh, United States, for example, would very much benefit from a more social security system and more equal healthcare access, because those kind of things are also among those that bring on protests and, and problems. And I believe that uh, all kinds of countries, they might say that our country has the best system and uh, this is very stable, but then when push comes to show if there is no equality, then we have this kind of a crisis situation. And uh, I believe that all over the world, UBI might be interesting concept. Of course, I understand that I'm talking from the welfare state perspective, but uh, in the North, but I'm a full supporter of that. But I also feel that we must here take into account the, um, the colonialism past that we have in Europe and in other countries and basically that uh, we we cannot anticipate that all of the countries have the money to themselves provide this to all citizens right now. But I do think that the income and the well-being of people should be even more in the center of international cooperation and development cooperation. So there is also potential for us to, to see if these kind of projects would be responsible and I think it's uh, good for EU to to push for this kind of projects. Okay, thank you. And uh, this hour has gone so fast and we're almost finishing. So I would invite the three speakers if they want to make a last suggestion of remark. Uh, this is the time. Uh, Natalie, you want to have a finishing say? Well, just very briefly, I guess, reflecting on what Alvina said, um, you of what's happening in the United States of America and what the world looks like. One of the things that's really incumbent on us as people who are looking towards, call it progressive, call it green, call it what you like, um, towards you know, the possibility of building a better future, um, Present, presenting solutions, being hopeful, saying this can be done, we can change things. And one of the things that COVID-19 has demonstrated is very much um, that change can happen very quickly. And in fact, that's my theory of political change is that it happens in big jumps. It doesn't happen slowly and gradually. So the last change, certainly UK or US perspective, was the rise of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. We've had 40 years of neoliberalism. Uh, we're going to, we're now in the middle of creating whatever comes next. And I think it's crucial for us to say that universal basic income doesn't solve all the problems by any means, but is, is a necessary precondition for a society that lives within the physical limits of this fragile planet, while also ensuring that everybody has a decent, secure life. Okay, thank you. Yulin, you have a final uh, yeah. suggestion? I would like to complement what Natalie said. <laughs> She already did it great. And just two things. Um, well, I think that uh, in the public opinion lies one of the greatest potentialities of basic income. And uh, it happens that uh, the more it's known, the more it's understood and the more it's like basic income. So I think uh, we have to do a lot of pedagogy among public opinion. We have to explain, explain, and explain what basic income is. And second, I think we have to understand that employment should not be the key for subsistence. We are going to a future where 
uh, in which uh, there is not going to be employment for everybody. And therefore, uh, we have to be able to guarantee the material existence of all, regardless of employment, and move towards a fair distribution of employment. Okay, thank you. And uh, last but not least, Alvina, would you your last uh, conclusion or propositions? With, what would that be? Yes, thank you, Dirk, for the great directing of this uh, discussion, and thank you, Julen, and thank you for these good closing remarks and I would just say that I hope that we can start seeing basic income and income in general as a human right and see the benefits that secure income and equality have for the whole society so that is something that I hope that we can push for and I hope that people can be more de demanding of their politicians to show these kind of new solutions to our acute problems and I very much hope that we can um, all push uh, good trials, quality trials of universal basic income and implementation of more universal basic income like models, if not going directly to the deep end at the first instance. And also, I really wish a lot of support for the citizen initiative that is coming on September Europe wide. So there is inspiring happening and I hope that we can grasp this uh, wind of change, as uh, Natalie kind of mentioned. So thank you all for a fruitful discussion. OK, also thanks for this uh, final conclusion. And I'm not going to try to draw an overall conclusion, but I think it's clear. And of course, COVID has really uh, reinforced this a lot, is that we are living in a society with a lot of sources of insecurity. And also having a job nowadays uh, is not a guarantee anymore to have a decent income so really finding new innovative ways of guaranteeing people an income uh, a basic form of security without having a job i think or full-time job is one of the key elements of let's call it a, a social or maybe a social ecological system of security of uh, the coming decades I want to thank all three speakers. It was very interesting. Again, having speakers from different countries, different uh, political levels, it's really uh, enriching the debate. I want to thank you all the audience. If you appreciate it, uh, there's a link uh, in the chat where you can see if you want to make a donation. This allows us to organize even more such green post-corona talks. And last but not least, Next week, we have our ninth session. It will be about the future of Europe with the philosopher Streco Horvat and the French MEP Marie Toussaint. So thank you all for watching and hopefully see you next week. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay, we're not live anymore. <laughs> Great. <laughs>